If you're just now tuning in, welcome to another episode of Backroom Beats. My name is Lamar Harris, aka DJ Nooney, hanging out with CJ Conrad. And we are excited that you are lending us an ear or watching this on YouTube. Again, make sure you, you subscribe to the channel, follow us on uh, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. And without further ado, we're going to jump right in to our guest. And I am like a little kid, like happily excited. Because, you know, anytime we have a trombone player, it's like, you know, the world is open up and the carpet just rolled out. So <laughs> this guy is a phenomenal musician, arranger, composer. Uh, he hails from the D.C. area. He's played with people such as Parliament Funkadelic, Prince, Sheila E., The Gap Band, Bootsy Collins, uh, George Duke, Stanley Clark, Mike Phillips, Chuck Brown and the Soul Searchers. The list goes the list goes <laughs> on and on. So this is one you need to grab everybody, put them, put them next to this, and lend an ear to the legendary Greg Boyer. What's going on, man? How's it going, man? Oh man, it's <laughs> it's going all right. We all tuned in today. So man. Oh yeah, you know, you know, plus being in DC. You know, the whole city's on lockdown now, so. <laughs> I, I was there for Christmas, and I, I went up there to see my cousin. I was like, man, you know, I'm like, you know, it was kind of just weird being out for Christmas. I'm like on the little bird scooter, like riding past the Washington Monument, riding past the Capitol. Yeah. Get to the White House, it's like, man, this is different. Okay. Now you can't, my cousin said, you can't like get like nowhere near downtown, so. Hey man, dude said he was gonna build a wall. He put it up around the White House. <laughs> right, around DC and the bridges. I mean, literally like yep. the White House, there's like like uh there's like all this like tarp paper and stuff. You can't like literally see into it at all. No, no, no. Wow. You can't. It's crazy. You know, welcome to 2021. <laughs> so uh how how was your 2020? Nuts. <laughs> Man, I, I just felt like all that I had gotten used to, you know, all I'd, you know, done all my life, the rug was just snatched out from under me. Wow. So you, you, it wasn't like a gradual restructuring anything. It's like an immediate, you know, okay, the old way is out, the new way is in. You know, like the format we are now, you know, there wasn't that much streaming right. before March. And now it's pretty much all you do. Right. You know, mm -hmm. so... Yeah, I mean, you man. know, I squeeze in a, a session every now and then. All right. And, you know, some live stream gigs, man, but for the most part, man, it, it's like square one and some. Yeah, it's, it's a totally different world that we're living in and stuff. Yeah. Um, You know, how, how do you feel like, um, like when everything kind of like opens back up, how do you think everything's kind of going to be for the music scene up there? Well, I, I don't think that it's going to go all the way back to the way it was simply because of the nature of what we're dealing with. It's not like, you know, somebody had some big space vacuum and they just sucked the virus off of the earth. Right. You know? So, but I, I think people will really be receptive to the fact that they can see some music now, you know, it's, I mean, let's face it, man, you know, looking at it on the screen, it's better than nothing. It's a nice outlet and everything, but you know, music is one of those things that has to be experienced live. Right. And when it gets back to that, I think everybody's going to be like, oh, breath of fresh air, ding dong, the witch is dead, all of that kind of stuff, man. Everybody will be happy. I'm thinking. Right. Well, just, just to be able to see somebody in person, you know? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we, we, before we uh, got started, you were saying that you were, you started off as a tuba player and on the way to be a classical tubist. You know, <laughs> you know what happened? No, that that wasn't my start. I started out as an alto player when I was 10 years old. Wow, that's right, that's right. And, and then, you know, I just went and l just taught myself everything in the band room and I ended up falling on the tuba. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, at one point I was playing tuba and bassoon in the concert band. Ooh. I was playing bass in church. My first professional gig was on a tenor. Wow. And I was playing trombone in the high school uh, big band. So, 
Dude, how'd you control your <laughs> embouchure with that? Like that bassoon ain't no joke, you know? No, no. Right. But see, when you when you young and, and you know you haven't really developed an embouchure yet, like my face, I, I was just all over the place, you know. I didn't have like a set embouchure yet, but you know, once I started locking in on something, then you know it was hard for me to go back to playing tenor after playing trombone for so long, you know? Right, man, mm-hmm. and and. What uh what made you kind of like kind of like fall in love with tuba? Because tuba is a very unique, different instrument. I'm um I'm just a a, a bass club kind of guy because I was playing alto my first few years, and then I switched to Barry. Hmm. And you know, once I got down in that lower octave thing, man, I couldn't get up out of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's... I like the bottom is where it's at. That's the foundation. That's how I started playing tuba, bassoon bass you know all of that low octave stuff i just dug it you know that's what's up man and you yeah. and the funk just kind of drug you in to get you in on trombone huh uh yeah yeah it, it did I, I i was playing trombone in the funk band off campus when i was down at saint mary's college in 76. wow and so all in all i was playing trombone maybe about a year and a half professionally before I got with P-Funk. Wow. Yeah. You know, I always tell people, people always love to debate about like the best horn sections and you know, they'll they'll always start with Earth, Wind & Fire. Then they'll go to Chicago, you know, and I'll be like, nah, there there are two (laughs) great horn sections. And actually I will say three now. There's there's always my opinion, like um, Fred Wesley, Cush, Maceo, and Rock and Rick. That was horny horns. The, the, yes. the horny horns. <laughs> My other favorite one that's in that same lineage is you, Greg, and Benny. You know, that's Yeah. Well, well, if it was a relay, you know, you know, Fred and Mason them ran out and we just took the baton. Wow. So us being, you know, young and music majors and all of that kind of stuff, we just took what they did and incorporated a youthful, a little bit more jazzy exuberance to the whole thing. And that pretty much is the, the foundation for our sound. Like, like with, uh, like how was that whole experience like working with George? Like, you know, for, for that transition going from like one certain sound with the horns to the sound that you guys got. Cause it's technically really, in my opinion, it's, it's two totally distinct sounds a little bit. Yes, it is. Uh, now, you got to understand, like I said, I was playing Bone for a year before I got with P-Funk. And through a series of events not involving an audition or knowing any of this, the, uh, one person knew another person, and boom, I was playing with P-Funk at 19 years old. Wow. Before that, I was playing in, in little juke joints with dirt on the floor for a buck a night. So... <laughs> So it was it was a huge jump from there to playing with with the with the mob, and it wasn't that you know years of working your way up through the ranks kind of thing. It was just like zero to a hundred. Wow! And it wasn't just the playing; it was you know the experience of the whole thing. Like you know meeting my idols, George and Bernie and Gary Shider. You see their names on the album covers, and next thing you know, you're standing right there next with them. And but but one thing I learned, and I learned very quick, is there's something very mythical about seeing them on the record, seeing them on uh, TV, if they were ever on TV. But when you meet them in person, they're just human beings. Right. Now, albeit human beings with sunglasses, turquoise, diapers, <laughs> and all of that other stuff, but they're still human beings. <laughs> right. No. And, yeah, the whole, you know, hero worship uh, Asalam and all of that stuff. It was just out the window the minute I met George, you know, so. Uh, and it didn't seem like you just developed your own character, man. You know, I, I remember one video I saw <laughs> you in them biking shorts and, and that Speedo in one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and boy, now, you're just I, making it. I, 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 it. Now, you think, you think of the, uh, speaking of biker shorts, now, I'm, I'm a cyclist by nature. You probably uh, might know that in some of the posts and everything, but I don't think there was anybody anywhere wearing bike shorts or spandex before I started doing that with P-Funk. So I might be the the forerunner of uh, of an 80s fad of some kind, man. 
and it was strictly born out of my love for cycling, which I just like, well, I'm gonna wear it here. You know, P-Funk, you can wear anything you want. So I just, you know, went on there and put my bike kit on, man. And I was up there wearing the... <laughs> hey, kill it. Yeah. yeah. You know, for, for you to just love like playing in the low register, man, like you have a very distinct sound as a trombonist in the upper register. Like I can tell yeah. when 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 it's when it's Greg Boyer, because it just your sound is just it's a unique sound. Like, you know, you get cats like um, you know, like Bill Watrous has a sound. Um, yeah. you, you know, even uh, Morrison has a sound whenever he plays trombone in upper register. Or but, even Fred, man. Yeah. You know, a lot of people just know Fred, you know, funky trombone, whatever, but he's got a couple of swing records out. If you ever revisit them, you would say to yourself, dang, he swings harder than any other trombone mm-hmm. player I've ever met or heard in my life. It's definitely, you know, he, he might not play all of them Gucci lines and he might not Berkeley you to death, but just that feel. Yeah. And you can hear how his feel as a jazz trombonist dictates how he plays funk and how he plays funk dictates how he plays jazz. That's and true. he's, he's nuts. <laughs> Uh, he, he said he wanted to start out. He said, I started off, I wanted to be a jazz musician. Then I wound up being a funk musician. And and, and the rest is history. But he, he, Funk is a black hole, man. You know, like once once you get in it or near it, you just get sucked in. Man, it's it's definitely a feeling and stuff like that. Oh, I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, even like, uh, you know, you even playing with like being from D.C., you know, I, I could just imagine what your go-go collection is. I can. As, as Marcus Miller <laughs> put it, he said, man, y'all must grow funk out the ground down there in D.C. <laughs> man. Oh. <laughs> is that-, that, that, po- that pocket, man, once they say B-E-A-T, give me that beat, it is on. <laughs> Man, it, there is no sound like that in like a lot of times if I do uh, world music mixes I always slide go-go in there and somebody's like what's that that's go-go that's from that's from up in DC you know I mean because it's its yep. own you, uh, unique sound I mean how was it like even like playing with uh with Chuck Brown now, now I'll tell you how that all happened I was living in LA and Greg and Benny were doing a lot of horn work in DC and they said man you need to move back home so you can get a piece of this. So eventually I did. And the, th- and the P-Funk Horns ended up playing with Little Benny and the Masters. <laughs> yeah. So Chuck heard us and he said, he, Chuck has always had a horn section in this band, first off. And he liked what we did. And he said, I'm the only one in town that's qualified to pay you. I said, boy, I said, I'm going to see about this. You know? nah. <laughs> He's talking all that, talking everything. And that was in 1989. I've been playing in that band since then. Wow. Even even past his passing in 2014, you know, I've been playing in, in a Chuck Brown band since 1989. You know, what were some of the things you, you feel like uh, that you learned from being in that band versus like even uh, being part of the P-Funk band? Well, the thing about Go-Go, probably more so than just about anything, uh, uh, maybe second line is about as close as it's going to get, is the relationship between the band and the audience. You know, there are little textbook chants that we, a band might say, and the audience knows exactly how to counter. And that will vary from band to band in in dc so it, it was an open dialogue uh, a circuit if you will of audience and band and it was like it was like a tribal it was pentecostal <laughs> it was a, a lot of things and it just is nothing like it man because i was like thinking to myself first time i heard some go-go really being played i like man shoot some explorers sound like they about to get cooked up in here. <laughs> in a big cauldron like old Bugs Bunny. And you got Albert Schweitz in the pot and he sliced the carrots up. <laughs> it's a lot in that pot, man. It's a lot in that pot, you know. 
I be telling cats, yes, you can't you can't do go go for real without like you need at least two percussionists. You need the drummer. Yeah. You need that funky bass line player that's holding that one down. You need that horn yeah. screaming out of nowhere, and you got to have a no. Oh no, go go. If you got a decent drummer and, and a conga player, and they locking, you almost don't need anything else. That's true. The, the, the mm. two of them, the two of them together, man, they'll set the they'll set the room ablaze. And it, it's called go go because it never stops. It's like you drop the needle, and, and two hours later, still cranking. Wow, man! So go go drummers are probably going to be in the best shape of anybody else on this planet. Go go players and Congo, I mean drummers and Congo players. That's true. That's true. Yeah, you know, and, and I had said the there, there was a, there was three horn sections, and one of the horn sections that I saw was something that was very unique because I'd never seen this instrumentation ever of two altos and a trombone player. I'm like, this is very interesting. <laughs> I know who you're talking about. <laughs> so how did that Man, come about? It was just whoever was there. There are some clips of uh, the MPG horns with three altos and a bone. Oh, that <laughs> yeah. would, that would have been like Maceo, Candy Dolphin, Mike Phillips, and you. Yeah. I, and that was, uh, uh, if you look up Prince at Webster Hall in New York, now, this is what's funny, because Prince, you know, he's always in and out of stuff, right? He was going through this Wayne Shorter, Cannabar, Adderley phase. Wow. So he wanted us to play the intro. Well, he wanted to use Hippodelphia as an intro to one of his songs. So I had to, uh, I was entrusted with having to write that up for four-part horn section. Wow. And... And then he goes into the song he did called Hey Mr. Man. It's um you can pull that up on on YouTube. But if Prince had us doing all kinds of wild stuff, man. Yeah, but that that's a it's just a unique sound. Like I would have never have thought like I know alto and trombone go together, but I never would have thought like having like two altos or three altos on the bone would create that like it's a it's a very distinctive sound that just cuts, you know. Yeah. I mean, but the thing of it is, it was probably more a thing of what notes are you playing within the arrangement than it was the instrumentation mm -hmm. itself. True. So, you know, Prince was like, I got to have Maceo. And then he also said, I want Candy in the band. And I was like the one constant, you know, because all these other people going and leaving, you know, they got their own bands and everything. And uh, I was just like there for the whole thing. So I would chart out all of the horn parts so that if Nazi was available and he came to do the gig, he'd have a book. Wow. You know, he'd have some parts. The same thing with uh, Eric Lees, who would go in and out of the band, out and out of the section. And at one point we had Lee Hogan's on trumpet. So it, it was all kinds of stuff, but I was entrusted with, with uh, the arrangements. It's a stack about that high with nothing but charts and they're all handwritten. <laughs> How long did it, so you didn't do the uh, do the Charles Mingus thing sitting around and having to chart it out on the napkin real quick and hand it to Well, him? sometimes it was like spontaneous. That's one of the things I got from Maceo. It was like, you could come up with something on the spot. And as long as everybody agrees to how it's played, it doesn't matter what's written. It could be the simplest line, you know, ba da ba ba da ba da ba ba da but if everybody's executing it to, you know, the same feel, you know, the, the same long, short, uh, all that stuff and playing it in tune, it sounds like, uh, it sounds like basty. <laughs> it's like, it seems like it's just like a whole nother different mindset, like dealing with somebody like, you know, like Prince and then versus like George or versus Chuck. How, how was the experience with Prince versus all of the rest of those? Uh, I, I tell people all the time, man, playing with Prince was like being in the fire department because <laughs> you never know when you had to play. You could be dead asleep, phone to ring, be downstairs dressed in an hour. We're going to do an after party. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> but, you know, you just did what you had to do, man. That's real. Because it, it wasn't like he ever slept. <laughs> <laughs> These are facts. 
Yeah, he 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 would say, "I got plenty of time to sleep when I'm gone." <laughs> I say, "Yeah, I'm thinking to myself, you might get there a little faster than you want if you don't get some rest." From it. Right. <laughs> What's your yeah. most memorable gig uh, playing with him? With Prince? Yeah. Um. Uh, well, it, it wasn't a gig; it was a, a TV uh, performance. It, Jay Leno was going to take off for the summer and he had Prince on for his last show before he took a break. Now Prince uh, says, he flies me out and he says, I want you, he flies me out on a, a Monday afternoon. I want you to do some orchestral woodwinds for this song I'm doing, this is ballad. And he wants me to write the parts, find the players in LA where I don't really know a lot of people. So I had to call this person, call this person to find a bassoon player and a bass clarinet and clarinet of all things, wow. and flute. And I was like, Ugh. so I'm doing all of this and I had to be ready for rehearsal the next day at eight in the evening. Wow. Pulled it off, man. Pulled it off. So again, you know, for all the people that, you know, YouTube junkies and stuff, Google Prince, somewhere here on earth, and you'll mm -hmm. see the end result of that. But it was, it all took place in like, within 48 hours. So it's, it's something <laughs> like that. Are you <laughs> giving you lines at all? Or is he just saying, hear the song, make something pretty around that? He he trusted me with, with uh uh, just coming up with something nice. And uh, that's the thing. Once he finds out you can do something, he'll push you all the way to your limit to see if you really that well, just trying to get you under the gun to make you see if you can pull it off. And, mm. but, but one of the things that he said, well, one of the things that Maceo said uh, that when uh, Prince asked us to join the band, he asked Maceo, then he said, and bring a trombone player with you because he didn't want to break up the chemistry. So mm -hmm. Maceo was telling him, and he writes too. He does arrangements and everything. And Prince is like, oh, yeah? So, okay, we have a special wonton soup for him. Wow. <laughs> so he, he would just push people, man. He just, all the time, he just didn't want you to rest on your laurel. Like, mm -hmm. e even the show. Once the show got really good, he would go and they go, brr, brr, brr. okay, let's do it another way. <laughs> Now, it might mean taking another song here and putting another one in, or he might do uh, 15 minutes of the song completely different than what he had been. Wow. Mm. So he he never wanted you to get comfortable at any point. It kind of, you know, keeps you honest, I guess. That will keep you honest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. So how, songs, so how many songs do you think you, you actually arranged because I like Prince's catalog was huge, you know. So it, how, how many? Oh, I don't know, man. I I I, I would say not a hundred, but I would say more than fifty. Really, that's a lot by hand. It, it is. It, yeah, I mean, I, I never stopped and sat there and said how many songs are there. I just just write charts and just pile them into this thing. He wanted to hire another horn section once. Mm. And he said, send the charts. I'm like, well, he want me to come out. He want me to send the charts and he ain't called me. So I thought to myself, okay, I'll send it. I sent the book out, right? Mm. But it's a bunch of charts, but they coded. So you don't know who gets what, unless the person that did them is there. Yes. So about a week later, he said, "Hey, Greg, can you fly out here?" <laughs> <laughs> that's, a that's a message for somebody out there, you know. Mm. Code it so yeah, you man. stay relevant at all times. That's real. A a exactly. You don't want to give somebody all the keys, or you can give them the keys, but they still got to get the gas from you too. <laughs> right. Mm. That's a message, man. Yeah. Man. Yeah. So so what what kind of horn are you playing on these days? I saw you 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 had had a had a fancy one in the back back there. Yeah, I'm playing on a uh the carbo. Mm. It's a, a small company in Switzerland that made carbon fiber trombones and carbon fiber trumpets, you know, 
the valve casing and all of that is metal, but everything that comes out of that into the bell is carbon. Wow. So, and I was looking for a carbon fiber trombone and I just did some research, man. I just stumbled across them, happened to be going to uh, Zurich, Switzerland. So I said, look, can I meet up with you guys? And they said, yeah. Dude came out there, rolled out the red carpet, took me out to the shop, try this, try that. And I was like, sold. Wow. <laughs> That's real. I mean, what yeah. made you want to go with, with a carbon fiber horn? Um, I was playing on this uh, Amarine, that gold horn I had with that nine inch bell. It looked like a bass, but it was a straight horn. Right. And they told me, you know, soon we will be introducing a carbon fiber trombone. I was like, okay, because, you know, I had a pretty good relationship with that factory also. So I got that horn, played it, and I was like, I like it, but, you know, having played a medium bore for so long, it was a stretch for me to go from five and a quarter, well, the metric version is 531, go from that down to a 500 bore horn. So, you know, you, you can't overblow it. Right. You know, I'm used to moving a lot more air than that. So I like it. I said, I kind of like it. But, you know, you don't, you know, you don't marry the first girl you kiss. You don't buy the first horn you play either. So so I, I, I did some research, man. And then I stumbled on um on uh, the Carbo and uh, Andy Keller. Great guy. You know, he has some decent artists. He had Roy Hargo playing one of his trumpets. Uh, Troy Andrews, AKA Trombone Shorty, was playing one of his trombones. And uh, God, I'm drawing a blank, but the guy was playing with Earth, Wind and Fire. He had a, a carbon trumpet. And then he had some symphony guys over there in Austria and Switzerland and Germany also playing them too. Wow. So he, he's, he makes a great horn. And the thing that, the, about the carbon is when you play a brass horn, the, the sound is all over the room. You know, the bell might be pointing that direction, but you can hear the sound all over the place. Right. And the efficiency of that carbon, even down to the way the fibers are overlaid, is designed for the sound to go strictly out that way. Because, you know, the most important thing is how the horn sounds when you're in front of it, not behind it. True. Yeah, so you know his concentration was on that, and I was. It took some getting used to because I'm like, I don't feel like I'm playing, but I had to train my ears to say, you just have to trust what's out in front of this horn, and not expect you know any of that stuff to come back. And oh wow, I didn't think about that because when you're playing the trombone, it really is about what you're hearing because there is yeah. nothing bad practice but like cheese you know what i mean so it's like right. you really are playing by ear wow i didn't think about that yeah and, and the thing of it too is you know if you do this that's how you make the sound out of the horn and if you do that and put your fingers over your ears it's loud inside your head mm -hmm. you know whereas you know with a saxophone or anything like that it's the reed that does the vibrating but you know your lips are doing it so any brass instrument, you can hear it inside your uh, ear canals as well as out front. Right. And you just have to trust that, you know, whatever you're doing, the notes, you you can hear the note, but you don't actually, you can't hear what it sounds like as much as you can with a brass instrument. And, mm -hmm. but when I listen back to recordings of myself playing on, I'm like, oh, okay, that's, that's pretty good sounding horn. <laughs> I gotta 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 try that out and take a take a peek yeah, into it. it. See, it's all all, all of the physics associated with that, man. And, and, and that's how I was able to learn how to play all them instruments. It's laws of physics associated with every instrument you play. If it's as simple as shorten the uh if you speed up the vibration, the notes higher. If you open up more holes, like on a woodwind, it's the higher note. If you close more, it's a lower note. Uh, any piano, guitar, whatever, it's the length of the string, they all have something in common as far as controlling the pitch and vibrations. And all I had to do was break code on it. Wow. Then once I figured that, then I could get into, okay, what's a half step, what's a whole step, and you know, all of that other stuff associated with figuring out scales and everything. Hmm.
For, for all the young listeners out there, this is science and math talking back to you. So it is related to music. We, we, we got a friend of ours who's a bass player and we, we always tease him because he's a mathematician. But you ask him like, okay. like math questions and stuff like that. You know, all of a sudden he just splurred all these answers and stuff like that. So now it yeah. makes sense how you playing bass. You just sitting around thinking about numbers and math and stuff. Yeah. So. I mean, if he's a bass player, you know that anytime you cut the number of vibrations in half, it's down an octave. Anytime you mm -hmm. double it, it's up an octave, which is why if you play in a bass, if you play one string up an octave, it's going to be directly between the nut and the bridge. Wow. That is a clean octave. And, and the same thing applies to black brass instruments, you know, is the number of vibrations. Of, if you go from a pedal B flat to a low B flat, you have double the speed of the vibration in your horn for it to get that octave. Wow. <laughs> from the word, from the mouth of Greg Boyer. And this, this goes all the way back to when I was putting nails in my headboard, tying rubber bands around them, making little makeshift banjos and well, harps and guitars <laughs> and stuff. You know, my brother and I, you know, we shared a room and I'm up there playing songs on there, da, 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 all these little rubber bands and nails in the headboard. And he'd say, play so and so. And I'd be like, da, 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 da. <laughs> like, how are you doing that with rubber bands and nails? <laughs> Rubber bands, so you put the nail in, you put a rubber band around it, stretch it. You know, if you stretch it more, it's going to go high. Or if you put it around another nail, it's going to make a different note. So I, I've always been fascinated with sound. Wow. I mean, you, you definitely can can tell in your plan, man, because you I've even seen you even use a plunger and get a whole nother different, like like doing a funk solo using a plunger. Like, you know, <laughs> Al Gray would be like, man, he making that thing talk. That's the whole point of a plunger, you know, is to make the, the trombone sound as much like a human as possible. So I, I actually first got hip to you uh, in a in one of my best friend's basement with his brother. Uh, uh, rest, rest in peace, the son of Star Child, uh, Steve Moore. And mm -hmm. they used to have me watching like all these funk tapes and stuff like that. And, you know, how do you feel that now, like this new generation of musician and artists, do you feel like they study enough of like what has come before them? Like they like like some of the musicians like our age would just have done. Well, I think that now you have at your grasp way more history, way more information than ever before. Like there's no way in the world I could have Googled J.J. Johnson when I was a teenager. You know, that just wasn't going to happen. You had to rely on, you know, your parents' record collection, which is how I got into jazz, or, you know, your friends, what you heard on the radio, what you saw on TV. Now, I will say that there was way more live music on television when we were younger. True. You know I mean, the only live music you're going to see on TV now is whatever talk show is going to be on late at night. Yeah. But, you know, there was no I Love Lucy and Ricky Ricardo, uh, anything like that at all, you know, now, not like it was back then. So that's true. But yeah, you know, you just gravitate toward what you like. And if you are curious about learning more, you will find out more. And that's with or without Google. True. You know, you know, back in the day, you used to just hang out in a record store. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, you know, all in the records, all that literature. And the thing about the library is, you know, you go into the books, you get to see pictures. You get to see Dexter Gordon, Miles Davis, Coleman Hawkins, Thelonious Monk. You know, it's like, okay, I'm going to wear a hat like Monk. Or, you know, I'm going to wear a, a badass suit like Dexter Gordon. You know, I'm going to have one of them little crayon mark mustaches like Cab Calloway, you know, something like that. <laughs> so, yeah, there was inf this information to be had. But like I said, it's a matter of how bad you want it, because you will look in the right place if you want it bad enough. That's true. Who, who are you listening to these days? Just like in general for a, like, you know, just inspiration of who you like that's out there right now. Um. 
God. It, it, it's so many, man. I mean, I, 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 I can't really say, man, because it's just so much stuff. And I don't just listen to trombone players. I listen to tenor players, guitar players, bass players, even drummers. You know, you know, if I wanted to get a pulse from something, but I, I will tell you, I listen to a lot of salsa and huh. Afro-Cuban jazz because as a trombone player, it doesn't get any better than that. That's true. It, it's a constant party. The parts are killing. There's plenty of room for improv. And the stuff is just so well written. Yes, that's true. That is very but, true. Let me ask you this. Um, so yeah. you've actually... You've played out a lot of different like genres and styles just in like the stuff you've done through your yeah. career. Do, do you find that things kind of bleed into each other for you? Like, do you find yourself like maybe, I don't know, kind of those salsa and those Afro Latin rhythms in, in your funk or in jazz or how, how, or do you really compartmentalize? Yeah, I mean. I mean, think about going on the road. You carry your luggage with you. You know, you got your you got your pants on one side. You got your shirts on the other. You got your socks. You know, at some point, you're going to pull from each pile, depending on whatever it is, you know, what day it is. You know, it, it and that's the way I, I approach playing music, man. I incorporate a little bit of something from over here or over mm -hmm. there and everything I'm playing. Now, I don't want to be just a straight down the middle funk player or a jazz player or, you know, a, a reggae player, man. I, I got to incorporate a little bit of, and, and that's what makes, you know, I think that's what establishes your DNA is, you know, where do you lean musically? You know, what do you mostly incorporate into what you do? And, you know, my thing, uh, if, if I can say so right off the top is TV themes the TV show themes and, and cartoon mm -hmm. themes and stuff like that. I love that stuff, man. And, you know, that stuff will make its way into just about every solo I do. <laughs> wow. You you watch, do you watch any uh, anime or anything like that? Not now, man. But, you know, I mean, I grew up on Warner Brothers, man. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> you know, Bugs Bunny, Roadrunner, and it, even my kids were little, man. I would... Like my kids will show up at one of my uh, concerts or something, you know, I'll be sitting there playing the solo and I incorporate the theme to Hey Arnold in there and just to watch <laughs> them fall out laughing, you know, <laughs> yes. or, you know, theme from Jungle Book, I'll stick that in and mm. they'd be like, I heard that daddy, I heard that, I heard that. So, you know, you play to your audiences. It is, it is, that's the entertainment factor. Mm, it's up in Seattle once, man, and just started rattling off smells like teen spirit in the middle of a solo. The 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 crowd went nuts. <laughs> I, I can I can understand that. I, I remember listening. And, 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 and it, was, it was when Nirvana was hot too. Wow. So <laughs> wow. You know, yeah. I mean, I remember listening to Parliament and doing flashlight, and all of a sudden you hear, but but da 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 like there was one section when we were doing uh, tear the roof off the sucker where the horns would come down front and we would just blow these lines and then stand back the guitar split so then we come in and blow another line and we were doing um all kinds of p-funk songs we'd incorporate get smart soul vaccination Ooh. and yeah all, all kinds of little things man and we just dipping in and out of stuff so, you know, we probably learned early on that every once in a while you got to throw like uh, uh, throw some bait at the audience just to make them say, perk up and say, where have I heard that before? <laughs> or I know what that song that is. You know, people love that kind of stuff, man. So, you know, that's the entertainment factor of it all. Plus, you know, there's a little bit of creation in that as well. But Right. But yeah, you can't ignore the, uh, the, the the entertainment factor, the aspect of you're on stage and you, you have to respect that, man. The stage is a sanctuary, you know, mm -hmm. even with spaceships landing and people throwing joints up and walking around with nothing on. They're still uh, doing stuff on stage that they ain't doing down the street in the park. So I, I, I'll just that, be curious. That's kind of about a 
tell you more. But like every band that you've been in, I can say entertains. Like it is a performance. It's not just like I'm here playing notes. It's like we're giving you a whole. Do you see that in your audience now? Or do you feel like that that's something that's kind of dying? Well, I think the performances now are probably more choreographed than they have been. So, you know, if you go see Bruno Mars, the mm -hmm. horns are doing a dance routine. Yeah. You know, yeah. and they're doing a whole bunch of stuff. Then they might play through two or three notes, but then they just start dancing some more. So they they are lean probably heavily toward the entertainment aspect, but almost to the point where it's just entertainment, not so much music. Mm. How, how many bands you know of now go out on the road and all they got is a DJ and 10 dancers? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I mean, man. You know, so, you know, I, I feel like if you're going to have a horn section or have a trombone or something, Make it worth seeing. Don't just stand up there and play. <laughs> That's true. Unless your DJ yeah. plays like live brass instruments and keys. Uh, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shameless plug. Shameless plug. Yes. Shameless. Shameless. <laughs> no shame in my game. <laughs> right. So, so how can our audiences catch up with you, Greg? Where can they find you at and find your music? I'm all over social media, man. I'm on, on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, uh, Trump Boyer, T-R-O-M-B-O-Y-E-R. I'm uh, on uh, Twitter, Greg Trombone, and of course, Greg Boyer. Uh, I have a, a music page and I have a page where I just talk recent shit to everybody. <laughs> I, uh, my wife was like, you spend too much time on that. I was like, honey, all I'm doing is being being an online smarty pants. So. <laughs> hey, it's, it's research. It's research. That's what I call it. Is, it is. It is. But yeah, you know what, man? I had a project sitting on the table. I've been working on it for about 15 years. Every time I record a little bit, and then whenever I come back to it, I want to do something different. Uh -huh. So it, I, I can't seem to lock myself on one thing. And it might be because this is what I want everybody to understand. If you're working on recording something, work on and finish one song at a time. Don't try to sit there and do five and six, because what's going to happen is you're going to run out of paprika and one song will get it and the other one won't. Then you're going to run out of cinnamon. One song might get something and you ain't going to have it. Wow. Get all your ingredients, bake one cake at a time. That has been the uh, the, the the crux or of of my musical existence as far as the solo project is concerned is my head's just all over the place. I'm hearing too many things, Man. you know. Words of wisdom for from the great and legendary Greg Boya. I mean, we thank you, man, for like, you know, coming on and, and sharing, sharing with everybody, you know. Um, oh, absolutely. You know, we, we, we got to also get you to St. Louis sometimes. I play with a group called the Low Brass Collective, and it's, like, made up of, like, all the brass, like, low brass players from the symphony players. Okay. That explains the 314 area code. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I saw you mention Chicago, and I was like, uh, but you know what, man? You can't go by the area code anymore. Nah. Not no more. My, my son live in L.A., and he still got his D.C. area code. He says, I ain't getting up off it. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, sometimes you got to keep those numbers, man, you know. Yeah. Well, we got to get you down here, back down here. I know you were here, uh, I think it's in 2018 with Maceo, but we got to get you back oh, yeah. down here to, to do a workshop and some Certainly, clinics. Certainly, man. You know, so, you know. Yeah, but, man, you know, if I just got to jump on my bike, ride out there with my horn on the back, boom. <laughs> Be on the lookout for Greg on a bike, riding, playing trombone. <laughs> you know. No, I, I've had I've had two Harleys. They gone now, man. Oh, I, don't, I don't trust my stuff out there, man. I, you know, I'm 62 years old, man. If I get out there and if I have an aneurysm or something, and I'm on a motorcycle, I'm dead. You in the car, all you do is pull over and put your flashes on and wait for the ambulance to show up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have nothing. I have nothing. I have nothing. Uh, <laughs> this I, I on the other hand have plenty. 
<laughs> man, we got to do this again. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Greg yeah. Boyer, ladies and gentlemen, Greg Boyer. Make sure you follow him. Make sure you, uh, you know, support him. And if you, uh, you know, having a concert, need a featured artist, make sure you bring him to a town near you. Until next time. Peace. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you. All right, you Polaroids. Stay in time with John.